group makes. So good morning, everybody. Uh, this is ICUJP. I'm Steve Rohde, proud to be the chair of this wonderful group. Uh, welcome to everyone who joins us uh, at these Friday forums at 7.30 a.m. California time. Uh, we've been doing this for uh, 22 years since our founding in the wake of 9-11 uh, through the convening of the Reverend George Regas of blessed memory and uh, many other people over the years, uh, including everybody here on this screen today. We have been at this work for uh, since 9-11. Uh, I'll use this moment to make an announcement that on September 10, a Sunday uh, at All Saints Church in Pasadena, we will have the annual George Regas Courageous Peacemaker Awards event uh, live and in person at All Saints. Uh, we've already announced several honorees, which include All Saints itself for its work uh, on housing. The theme of this year's program is uh, housing is a human right. Uh, and we're honoring our own Anthony Manusis and Jill Shook and their organization for the extraordinary work they do on housing. Uh, we have invitations out uh, to uh, other organizations uh, to honor and, and some special surprises. Uh, Bonnie Boswell, who many of you know, uh, who was an early um, supporter of ICUJP and has done a lot of broadcasting, hosted a television show with uh, Reverend uh, Jim Lawson, one of our founders. Uh, Bonnie will be our host and MC. Uh, please save uh, September 10 from uh, 1 to 3 in the afternoon for that event. The event is free, but we're asking for uh, volunteer contributions and also uh, sponsorships, and you'll be getting more information about that shortly. Uh, this is an effort to honor George Regas, our convener, uh, the continuing work of ICUJP, as well as some wonderful uh, honorees. Um, are there any other affiliate uh, reports, organizations working closely with us? Okay. Well, as is our tradition, and I always look forward to Phil's uh, reflections because they are so thoughtful. Uh, Phil, go right ahead. Okay. I'm going, going to read you a passage from a book, and I want you to guess the author and the name of the book when I am done. Um, it might ring true for some of you, maybe not the others. This little orchard will be part of a great holding for the debt will have choked the owner. This vineyard will belong to the bank. Only the great owners can survive for they own the canneries too. And four pears peeled and cut in half, cooked and canned, will cost 15 cents and the canned pears will not spoil. They will last for years. The decay spreads over the state and the sweet smell, the great sorrow on the land. Men who can graft I'm sorry, men who can graft the trees and make the uh, sod fertile and big can find no way to let them, uh, let the people eat their produce. Men who have created the fruit, created the fruits in the world cannot create a system whereby their fruits may be eaten. And the failure hangs over the state like a great sorrow. The works of the roots and the vines and the trees must be destroyed to keep up the price. And this is the saddest, bitterest, bitterest thing of all. Carloads of oranges dumped on the ground. The people came for miles to take the fruit 
but they could not eat the fruit. How could they, how could they buy oranges at 20 cents a dozen if they could drive out and pick them up? And then, and men with hoses squirt kerosene on the oranges and they are angry at the crime, angry at the people who have come to pick the fruit. A million people hungry, needing needing the fruit, and kerosene is sprayed over the over the over the oranges. And the smell of rot fills the country. Burn coffee for fuel for the ships. Burn corn to keep warm. That makes a hot fire dump potatoes in the river and place and guards along the banks to keep the hungry people from fishing them out, slaughter the pigs and bury them and let the protrusions drip down into the earth. There is a crime here that goes beyond denunciation. There is a sorrow here that weeping cannot symbolize. There is a failure here that topples all our success. The fertile earth, the straight tree rows, the sturdy trunks, and the, and the ripe fruit, and children dying of pellagra must, be, must die because the profit cannot be made from an orange. And coroners must fill in the, certi birth, fill in the certificates, died of malnutrition because the food must rot, must be forced to rot. And I'm going to stop there and take guesses on who this is. And the prize goes to Carol Francis. The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. And I'll show you. Carol Francis just showed her copy of the book. Chapter 25. Here, here's mine. Wow. It's, a, it's the first edition that my father bought in 1939. Wow. Um, I'm going to read you the closing passage of this uh, now that we know what we're talking about. The people come with nets to fish for potatoes in the, in the river, and the guards hold them back. They come in rattling cars to get the dump oranges but the kerosene is sprayed and they stand still and watch the potatoes float by, listen to the screaming pigs being killed in a ditch and covered with quicklime. Well, okay, anyway. Um, I love that chapter. That, you know, this, this book, how many of you are familiar with the book? One, two, three, four, five. No, the movie. Anyway, yeah. Anyway, it, it's a incredible book. It's mostly a novel uh, following the Joad family from the dust storm ridden Oklahoma to the um, to the what the farmlands of California, and he intersperses the novel with passages like I just read you to give context and and meaning to the story but anyway just personal background i was born in 39 my dad was working with farm workers migrant farm workers in the central valley at the time and when uh john steinbeck's book came out in 39 and woody guthrie's dust bowl ballads came out about the same time Dad had them all. And um, that's what I grew up on. That was the fodder that I, that I grew up on. And so this, this book and that, and that story, the big story, is part of my heritage. And I wanted to share that. That's terrific, Phil. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. You've got to be carefully taught. Mm. Uh, that's the theme of my uh, presentation today. Uh, 
in speaking with Rick and preparing for this program, uh, I look back at uh, four book reviews that I've recently written. As many of you know, I'm uh, retired from almost 50 years practicing law uh, toward the end of that career. Uh, although the last qu uh, quarter of it, I was a civil rights lawyer uh, doing First Amendment law and civil rights law in federal court. and. Uh, in that period and earlier, did a lot of writing, which I've always found, even when I was busy practicing law, uh, it was a necessary adjunct to the daily uh, grind of practicing law to um, step away to read good and a few bad books that I was able to review. and. Um, and I've continued to do that uh, through the auspices of the Los Angeles uh, Review of Books, Truth Dig, the Los Angeles Lawyer Magazine, uh, LA Progressive, and other publications. Um, I find book reviewing uh, a tremendously satisfying experience. Uh, there is a beginning and an end to it. Um, I'm able to draw on the brilliance of others, uh, and I try to, in many cases, translate uh, long and, and comprehensive books uh, in a way that uh, readers can get a taste of them and go on, hopefully, in many cases, to read the books in full. Uh, but if not, as I do when I read, uh, the New York Review of Books, uh, the New York Times Book Review, and others to to get some sampling of the important work that is being done uh, in these fields. I primarily review nonfiction books, and I realized that in this uh, recent period, because of my own concerns uh, about uh, contemporary uh, life in America, which will be the future of American history, uh, as well as looking back, um, that there were some strong themes in these four book reviews. And today I'm going to try to trace them and engage you as much as possible. Uh, I'll be reading some passages from the books themselves and from my reviews, uh, because I think uh, this is a moment when uh, looking back is, uh, is important because there are those today in uh, state legislatures around the country and Congress, frankly dominated by Republican uh, majorities that want to distort that history, that want to cancel it, that want to erase uh, elements uh, in American history that are that are so important. Uh, these legislatures are doing this in the name of not wanting to upset the children, uh, not wanting to make them feel guilty uh, for America's past. Uh, so that movement uh, is active and uh, virulent uh, throughout America today. And we have to address it and combat it uh, by using every means necessary to uh, develop as true, comprehensive, and accurate a history uh, of this country, uh, warts and all, flaws and all, if we have any hope of uh, moving past this period. Uh, so what I found was that these four books uh, race the making of American political science, teaching white supremacy, America's democratic ordeal and the forging of our national identity, the nation that never was reconstructing America's story 
and a republication of when affirmative action was white, the untold story of racial inequality in the 20th century America. Uh, that uh, each of these books, each in their own way and taken together, uh, do attempt to tell a far more accurate and comprehensive story uh, of the true founding of this nation uh, and what uh, went on subsequent to that uh, in a way that I think is enlightening. And I took as my opening theme the haunting words from the 1949 Broadway musical South Pacific by Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein II, <clears throat> in which they have a penetrating uh, song, uh, which startles a lot of people, uh, seeming out of context in this uh, beautiful story of the South Pacific. But uh, Hammerstein and Rogers uh, were very serious uh, about the state of the world in 1949. Uh, briefly, you many of you know these lyrics. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be talk, taught to be afraid of people whose eyes are oddly made and people whose skin is a different shade. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught before it's too late, before you are six or seven or eight, to hate all the people your relatives hate. You've got to be carefully taught. It's rather extraordinary uh, and, and piercing and, and uh, unalloyed and direct uh, in terms of capturing uh, the sad condition of how hatred is not only passed on generation to generation in our homes and among our families, but it is taught and has been taught in this country uh, in uh, our American educational system. This is why we call it systemic racism. It, 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 it's because the systems in our country have taught and perpetuated uh, this form of racism and white supremacy. So these first two books um, regarding the uh, race and the making of American political science, I was stunned to read how what otherwise might be thought of as a neutral system of teaching political science was in fact a breeding ground for teaching uh, racism in this country. I was a political science major at Northwestern University before going to Columbia Law School. Uh, and I shuddered in reading this book uh, to realize that in the 1960s, uh, we were only barely emerging from the period uh, in which uh, the very invention of political science uh, had such deep racist roots. And this second book, Teaching White Supremacy, which broadens the topic from uh, political science to all of high school and college textbooks. So these books describe the institution of American education, which has trained its teachers and taught its students to believe that slavery was good for the enslaved, that reconstruction was a disaster, that African-Americans were innately inferior and that the destiny of the United States was to be ruled by the descendants of white Europeans. You know, I wrote this book review several months ago uh, only to have uh, the state of Florida in its new curriculum uh, tell us 
uh, that uh, the about the good aspects of slavery uh, and how uh, enslaved people learn skills uh, when they were enslaved. Uh, such a deplorable way to uh, encourage both sidism uh, as if there was anything redeeming uh, about slavery. And I've told you about the Florida uh, Board of Education, and I may, time permitting, come back around at the end of this talk to what's going on. It is imperative that we keep the focus on systemic racism in the United States. We must combat the notion that racism is simply a personal attitude that individuals happen to develop for which society as a whole bears no responsibility. So turning specifically to the uh, first book on the development of political science in America by Jessica Blatt. Uh, she is a associate professor of political science at Marymount Manhattan College. And I found her book convincingly demonstrates that race thinking shaped US political science at its origins far more profoundly than has previously been recognized. She explained that the precept on which US political science was founded in the late 19th century was, quote, the idea that our politics are born into us, indeed specifically that some people are innately cut out for self-government and progress while others self-government and progress, while others are by their constitutions more suited to traditional forms of authority. Uh, well into the 20th century, major political scientists understood racial difference to be oh. a fundamental shaper of political life. I can't they wore down down with they, uh, Daryl, can you go on mute, Daryl? They... Uh, these uh, major political scientists wove popular and scientific ideas about racial difference into their accounts of political belonging, of progress and change, of the proper hierarchy and democracy and its warrants. We see, and I'm ashamed to cite it because I was a graduate of Columbia Law School, that Columbia University's history department in the uh, 1880s and 1890s was a breeding ground for this, that the meetings, publications, and other activities of the American Political Science Association uh, in the decades following its founding in 1903 uh, furthered these racist ideas, that the first US-based international journal the Journal of Race Development, founded in 1910, uh, spread these ideas in an international context. And that the efforts in the 1920s by prominent academics to bring their version of scientific methods to bear on political questions and to integrate the study of politics into an interdisciplinary social science matrix at major universities was at the heart of the creation of political science. We, we have to know the name of John W. Burgess, uh, one of the founders of political science in the United States, who established the first doctoral programs in politics in the nation. Uh, now, these are to use pejorative and, and stereotypical labels, which often uh, conceal uh, a more varied uh, situation. These were no rednecks. These, he was a constitutional scholar, a teacher of future presence, the prominent commentator on domestic and foreign affairs. Uh, Burgess was born in 1844 to a slaveholding Union family in Tennessee. 
and he fought in the Union Army. But by, now, by 1886, he founded Political Science Quarterly. And the early volumes of Political Science Quarterly would carry articles with the following commentary. The Negro was not an Anglo-Saxon or a Celt or a Scandinavian, only underdeveloped and with black skin. The African was on the contrary, a wholly distinct race and the obstacles to social equality and political coefficiency with our own race was not facetious, but anthropological. Burgess would write that black skin means membership in a race of men, which was never of itself, has never of itself succeeded in subjecting passion to reason, has never therefore created any civilization of any kind. Now, the, the problem with racism is it exposes the ignorance of the racist. I've given you the credentials of Burgess and even writing uh, in this century, he could claim that, that there were no black civilizations of any kind on the face of the earth, uh, ignoring the amazing accomplishments in Africa and the Middle East and elsewhere. Burgess would write that uh, in the Reconstruction period, Blacks were ignorant barbarians. And Burgess, according to the author, held firmly that American Indians, Africans, and Asiatics ought never to, quote, form any active directive part of the political population in the United States. And he was skeptical about the wisdom of even extending uh, the voting right and suffrage to any non-Aryan whites. He spoke of the white man's mission, his duty and his right to hold the reins of political power in his own hands for the civilization of the world and the welfare of mankind. Burgess taught political scientists and by extension, the teachers of our teachers and the teachers of our students, that any participation in government of non-Teutonic people was a recipe for corruption and confusion, since only the Teuton possessed a superior political genius. I'm, I'm quoting directly from the writing and teachings of Burgess. Burgess, in turn, taught William Dunning, uh, who was born in Plainfield, New Jersey, and educated at Dartmouth, and had his doctorate at Columbia. And he established the now notorious Dunning School of Reconstruction at Columbia, which Today's leading historian of the Reconstruction, Eric Foner, said was part of the edifice of the Jim Crow system because it claimed that Black people were incapable of taking part in American democracy and therefore justifying denying them the right to vote on the grounds that they abused it during Reconstruction. And who was one of their students, Woodrow Wilson. Far too many people uh, don't know the racist history of Woodrow Wilson, the 28th president of the United States who got his PhD in political science at John Hopkins University and taught at various universities. Wilson maintained many of Burgess's racist precepts, 
including, as the author summarizes, a racialized conception of the collective shaping and authoring of government. Uh, according to Jessica Blatt, Wilson's well-received 1889 textbook, The State, rehearse the familiar themes of the Aryan origins of the Anglo-American political tradition, a link between Teutonic history and the development of individual liberty, and the explicit rejection of universalizing natural law or social compact theory. All of this back then brought us to eugenics, here, a distorted scientific quasi-theory, embraced at the time, we have to confess, by progressives, including Margaret Sanger and others. A leading proponent of eugenics, Charles B. Davenport, established the Galton Society in 1918 and housed it within the American Museum of Natural History. Consequently, uh, the author Blatt summarizes a cross generational and theor across generations and theoretical divides, political scientists were united in a near consensus that African Americans were inferior, politically incompetent, and unsuited to live under a legal system constituted by and for Anglo Saxons. Consequently, quote, by their very presence in the United States, African-Americans challenge social peace and the viability of constitutional principles and any attempt to integrate them into American democracy necessarily stemmed from a catastrophic misunderstanding of that basic truth. It was for this reason that American political science was a consensus that the emerging Jim Crow uh, regimen of racial segregation and stratification represented a moderate, pragmatic response to the realities of racial difference. And she goes on to summarize that as well. So that's uh, that book in that slice of American history can you imagine the hundreds of teachers every day in their higher education taught those principles as neutral, acceptable history as they went on to teach it and spread it? The second book, Teaching White Supremacy by Donald Yacovoni, widens the lens uh, to explain the broader historical and cultural context that preceded and overlaps the developments of political science. Yacovoni is a lifetime associate at Harvard Center for American and African American Research, winner with Henry Louis Gates of a 2014 NAACP Image Award for the African Americans, Many Rivers to Cross, and he's a recipient of the W.E.B. Du Bois Medal from Harvard University in 2013. This is an extraordinary book because in summary, he says, embodying the values to be treasured by rising generations of Americans, textbook authors, passed on ideas of white American whiteness from generation to generation. Writers crafted whiteness as a national inheritance, a way to preserve the social construction of American life and ironically its democratic institutions and values. Uh, this author frames his book as quote, an exploration of the origins and development of the idea of white supremacy, how it has shaped our understanding of democratic society and how generation after generation of Americans have learned to incorporate that vision into their very identity. Yacovoni opens 
and many of you know this passage by James Baldwin, uh, writing in 1965, quote, I was taught in American history books that Africa had no history and that neither had I. I was a savage about whom the least said the better, who had to be saved by Europe and who had to be brought to America. Now, this author is not the first to observe the role of American textbooks. In 1939, the NAACP surveyed popular American history textbooks. And Iacovoni quotes a black student uh, who concluded that since textbooks drilled American supremacy into the minds of growing children, I can see how hate and disgust is motivated against the American Negro. The major goal of this important book was to debunk the notion of blaming the persistence of racial inequality only on the legacy of Southern slavery. Now, he fully holds Southern slavery responsible for its devastating consequences. But one of his purposes is to point out that it was Northern white supremacy that proved the more enduring cultural binding force planting along with slavery in the colonial era, intensely cultivating in the years before the Civil War and fully blossoming after Reconstruction, inculcating relentlessly throughout the culture and in school textbooks, it suffused Northern religion, high culture, literature, education, politics, music, law, and science. As he sees it, history textbooks proved a perfect vehicle for the transmission of the idea of white supremacy. U.S. history textbooks began to significantly increase in the 1820s as New England, New York, and parts of Virginia established publicly supported high schools that mandated the teaching of history. The demand for textbooks blossomed in the 1890s when several American publishers formed the American Book Company. By 1912, annual textbook sales soared to at least $12 million, about $300 million in modern currency. Six years later, sales had almost doubled. By 1960, 50 U.S. textbook publishers earned about $230 million annually, which leaped to over a half a billion by 1967. The author writes that far from mere aggregations of dead facts, history texts served as reservoirs of values, patriotism, and national ethos, which sought to create unity through storytelling, creating a national identity that could serve as a roadmap for the future. He agrees that history textbooks were the prayer books of our national civil religion. And he's quick to point out that we have been selective in what we cherish in them and blind to what in time has proven disconcerting, if not shameful and humiliating. Uh, he rests the origins of this to a man named John H. Van Every, E-V-R-I-E, -E, whom he calls the nation's first professional racist, who worked tirelessly to permanently bind white supremacy to the nation's democratic ethos. Uh, Van Every formed a publishing company with his partner Rushmore G. Horton, who produced a textbook, The Youth's History of the Great 
civil war. One of the jobs of that textbook was to recast and demolish the history of reconstruction. Uh, we know now through the work of Eric Foner and others that reconstruction was a hopeful but brief period in American history when it sought to incorporate freed people and Northern blacks into American society with equal constitutional protections and responsibilities. Eric Foner writes that in the South, it was a massive experiment in interracial democracy without precedent in the history of this or any other country at the time. During Reconstruction, 16 African Americans would serve in Congress. This is within years of the end of slavery. More than 600 African Americans would serve in state legislatures, and hundreds more in local offices from sheriff to justice of the priests across the South. The era represented, in um, Yacovoni's words, a colossal effort to transform and refound the nation and its governing principles, in short, to eliminate the world that Van Every had tried to create. But as we know, and as these other books will tell us, slavery may have been abolished, and there's serious questions about that even to today in terms of forced labor, labor and all the rest. But what Reconstruction threatened was to dismantle white supremacy. White supremacy survived the abolition of slavery. Reconstruction lasted only 12 years, was replaced by a resurgence in white political control, Jim Crow laws, disenfranchisement of black voters, and full-blown segregation. But to justify that sorry result, history textbooks thereafter were pressed into service to demonize Reconstruction generally to glorify the Ku Klux Klan in particular, to promote the lost cause mythology, to recast the entire history of the South and reframe the Civil War as a constitutional assertion of states' rights. And we'll come back to this when I look at the book, The Nation That Never Was. So the textbooks labeled Reconstruction a failure. They claimed that Blacks were innately inferior using the textbooks, using words like ignorant and timid, poverty-stricken ignoramuses. With a ballot in his hands, he is a menace to civilization and therefore unable to govern. Those were the textbooks until the 1960s that were used to teach American youth. They taught that the KKK, made up of many former Confederate soldiers, were, quote, merely seeking fun and excitement, representing a noble effort to promote and protect the homes and women of the South from pillage and other outrages of the Negroes. Here is a, let me get this page. So we have books uh, written by Northerners as well as Southerners. In 1896, Samuel Train Dutton was superintendent of schools in Brookline, Massachusetts when he wrote the ever popular Morse Speller, which enjoyed its 13th edition in 1903. In it, he wrote, to the Caucasian race, by reason of physical and mental superiority, it has been assigned the task of civiliz civilizing and enlightening the world. 
Then with the advent of the 20th century, the overwhelming majority of American textbooks began with the assumption underlying Thomas Maitland Marshall's popular American history, first published in 1930, that the history of the United States was a history of the white man, his struggles against Native Americans, usually rendered as red savages, and his need to control the lives of African Americans who sought to destroy the superior race. Marshall, a professor of history at Washington University in St. Louis, began his textbook with a headline, The Story of the White Man. Here's a passage from that book, quote, the Negro of plantation days was usually happy. He was fond of the company of others, and he liked to sing, dance, crack jokes, and laugh. He admired bright colors and was proud to wear a red or orange bandana. He was never in a hurry and was always ready to let things go until the morrow. Most of the planners learned not to whip but loyalty based on pride, kindness, and rewards brought the best results. Leading textbooks by prominent historians like James Ford Rhodes, the president of the American Historical Society, relied on the, quote, science promoted by such Harvard University a famed ethnologist, Louis Agassiz. And they informed their readers that Blacks were either a separate species or vastly inferior humans, indolent, playful, sensual, imitative, subservient, good-natured, versatile, unsteady in purpose, devoted, and affectionate. Until the mid-1960s, American History instruction from grammar school to university relentlessly characterized slavery as a benevolent institution, an enjoyable time, and a gift to those Africans who had been lucky enough to be brought to the United States. Finishing this aspect of our my second book review, I quote, Arthur Schlesinger Jr., who in 1998 wrote The Disuniting of America, Reflections on a Multicultural Society. He bluntly declared that white Americans began as a people so arrogant in convictions of racial superiority that they felt licensed to kill red people, to enslave black people, and to import yellow and brown people for peon labor. We white Americans have been racist in our customs, in our conditioned reflexes, in our souls. I think these two books I've discussed so far ably demonstrate we've done that in our textbooks and in our political science. Let me turn to the third book uh, that so impressed me because of its uh, insights, The Nation That Never Was by Kermit Roosevelt. This is a book Roosevelt wrote. He is the great, great grandson of President Theodore Roosevelt and a cousin of Franklin Roosevelt. I believe in this book, he persuasively makes the case that the standard story, the Declaration of Independence, the American Revolution, and the Founders' Constitution tells us a fundamentally false story about where our values come from and about who the heroes and villains of our national story really are. But Roosevelt's book is hopeful because he believes there's another story that hasn't been told. There's a different, better way to understand America. 
It is a more true, it is more inspiring, and it is more useful. It can bring us together in a way that the standard story only promises to. Kermit Roosevelt has taught constitutional law at the University of Pennsylvania for 18 years. He clerked for Supreme Court Justice David Souter and is the author of The Myth of Judicial Activism, as well as two novels. The essential point of his book is that, quote, our ideas, our ideals were not handed down by the men who created the America of 1776. Instead, these ideals today were articulated in reaction to the oppression <coughs> and exclusion of that America and fought for in large part by the people who were excluded. He reminds us of all the tumultuous events which happened after the founding. He reminds us of the defeat of the Confederacy in the Civil War, the Emancipation Proclamation, the Gettysburg Address, Reconstruction, the creation of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Each of those pivotal events was specifically directed at overturning the institution of slavery and entrenching and the entrenched regime of white supremacy that was so deeply embedded in the founding documents and in the standard story. You know, he reminds us that the prominent figures in the standard story were all slave owners. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison. I was shocked anew to be reminded that 47 signers of the Declaration of Independence were slave owners. 34 of the 47, 34 were slave owners. 26 of the 55 delegates to the Constitutional Convention collectively owned 1,400 enslaved people. That no less than eight of the first 12 U.S. presidents were slave owners. More significantly, the main problem with the standard story is that it leaves out, it marginalizes Black Americans and indeed all Americans who would not compromise with slavery. Today's America is the result of the struggle of people, white and black, to repudiate the early history of this country, to reverse it, to amend it, and to write a new story. Roosevelt structures his book around three elements of the standard story, and his insights are very meaningful. He begins with the Declaration of Independence, which so many people to this very day uh, proudly cite as the key document. It is key, but not for the reasons many people think. Unlike the egalitarian declaration of the rights of man and of the citizen adopted by the Revolutionary National Assembly of France in 1789, which by the way, prompted France to abolish slavery in its colonies in 1794. Ours was a declaration of independence not a declaration of rights. As Roosevelt writes, it was written at a specific moment and for a specific purpose. It was designed to do two things, to announce that the American colonists were throwing off allegiance to the British crown and to justify that act. But Listen and think about this. The colonists were in fact declaring independence from a country 
in which abolition of slavery had begun to gain strength. We were freeing ourselves from a country that was moving toward the abolition of slavery. In 1701, Lord Chief Justice Sir John Holt had declared that as soon as a man sets foot on English ground, he is free. Then the decision of Somerset versus Stewart in 1772, in which a slave was free who had been brought to England from Virginia. This case was reported widely in colonial newspapers in the United States. They saw the writing on the wall. By 1774, between 10,000 and 15,000 slaves had gained freedom in England. Roosevelt reports that historian Matthew Mason sees evidence that the American slave owners saw the Somerset court decision as a fundamental denial of their property rights and their political control over their slaves within an increasing hostile anti-slavery empire. Indeed, while drafting the declaration, and I was surprised to learn this, the Continental Congress rejected Jefferson's proposed clause, which condemned King George III for introducing slavery into the United States for that execrable commerce of capturing a distant people and carrying them into slavery. Jefferson wanted to cite that as a grounds for rebelling. Instead, what was approved in the final draft was a complaint that the king was encouraging enslaved people in America to rebel. The Declaration, of course, opens with the memorable proclamation when, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another. They should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. Jefferson was speaking of one people of whom he was a member, white privileged males, colonists, not those, quote, distant people. Roosevelt says the question of the declaration, the question the declaration answers is when some insiders can reject the authority of other insiders. How government should treat outsiders was a totally different question. The declaration assumes that each political community controls its own membership. Enslaved people because they were outsiders to the colonial political system, they were outside the Declaration of Independence. One reason the colonists wanted independence was so they could preserve the sovereignty to decide whether or not to allow slavery. However, what they then, what do we make of that lofty phrase, all men are created equal. The men in the declaration speaks of the insiders. The one people Jefferson refers to in the opening, enslaved people were not members of that one people. They were not men. They were, in Jefferson's word, a distant people. As hard as it may be for American, American, modern Americans to accept this interpretation, Roosevelt points out that the contemporary understanding of the Declaration was pretty clearly that it was about national independence, not individual liberty, and certainly not the liberty of political outsiders. 
Those outsiders were mentioned in the declaration. There are references to enslaved people, Native Americans, and Hessian mercenaries. And they are all seen as threats to the insiders. Enslaved people threatened domestic insurrection and Native Americans were, quote, merciless savages. But Roosevelt doesn't just leave it there. He says that once we accept that Jefferson's declaration did not contain the values we now find in it, two other points follow. First, those values came from somewhere else. And second, we who invoke those values are not the heirs of the signers of the declaration. Instead, we are the heirs of the enslaved people and the abolitionists who read the declaration differently from its author. We're the heirs of Abraham Lincoln who advanced that vision in national politics of the U.S. Army that fought for it, and the Reconstruction Congress that wrote it into law, and the civil rights workers who brought those words back to life in the 1960s. Conversely, and I call this a mind-bending insight in Roosevelt's book, the real heirs of the signers of the Declaration of Independence may be the Confederates who declared their independence to protect the rights they thought they were due under the government they had created. Thus, if the slavery supporting Confederates are the real heirs of the slavery protecting signers, then we who oppose the Confederates should proudly see ourselves as the heirs of those who fought to end slavery. Our America may have come into being not because we fought a war in the name of the ideals of the Declaration, but because we fought a later war, the Civil War against the ideals of the Declaration and rejected them. We won that battle, secured the Emancipation Proclamation, and we are no longer the, in hostage to slave-owning founders. In his book, this brings us to the second element of the standard story, the triumphal mythology surrounding the American Revolution. In the standard story, the revolution was a glorious war for liberty and freedom, but liberty and freedom for whom? Roosevelt notes that the only freedom the revolution brought to tens of thousands of enslaved people was the freedom they gained by ex escaping from the patriots and finding refuge with the British often joining the royal forces to fight against their enslavers. In fact, slavery was so important to the founders that they insisted in including in the Treaty of Paris, the document that ended the Revolutionary War, a requirement that the British forces depart without carrying away any Negroes or other property of American inhabitants. Stating that scholars may disagree, Roosevelt himself concludes that at a minimum, the drive for independence created a conflict over slavery. And in that conflict, the patriots were on the pro-slavery side. As famed English writer Samuel Johnson acidly asked, how is it that we hear the loudest yelp for liberty from the drivers of Negroes? What Roosevelt forces us to consider is the uncomfortable fact 
that the revolution was a war fought by slave owning states against a nation that had partially banned the practice, that it had the effect of protecting slavery from the only power that could have abolished it, and that it was fought even in part for that reason. That brings us to the third element of Roosevelt's extraordinary book, The Founders' Constitution. And that phrase is very important. As we'll come to in a few moments, the Constitution was amended. So we are looking at the Founders' Constitution. And while it had that stirring preamble that says the aims are to establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty. Roosevelt points out that all of those goals were qualified by the following phrase, to ourselves and our posterity. In other words, to the insiders. Roosevelt joins the majority of modern scholars in opining that the original unamended constitution firmly supported slavery. I don't have to, with this group or audience, rehearse the provisions. We had the infamous three-fifths definition of slaves as being three-fifths of a person. There could be no restriction on the importation of enslaved people for 20 years that was built into the Constitution, and the founders included the Fugitive Slave Clause in the Constitution, requiring persons escaping to another state to be delivered to their owners. So that was the founders' Constitution, and there's much more to that. But I want to quickly move to what he eventually calls a new birth of freedom. Roosevelt points out that the Emancipation Proclamation was signed on January 1, 1863. It is the first time in American history that the nation actually set itself against slavery. Before that, American unity was built on the exclusion or subordination of Black Americans. The Emancipation Proclamation declared that all persons held as slaves in the rebellious states are and henceforth shall be free. Lincoln felt the only constitutional power he had at that time was to free the slaves within the rebellious states. No president had ever uttered those words that all persons held as slaves are and henceforth shall be free. At Gettysburg in 1863, Lincoln redefined America, not as a union of slaveholders, with a founding document that protected that abhorrent institution, but a nation, quote, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Eviscerating its racist roots, Lincoln could now redefine and embrace the declaration regardless of its white supremacist origins. Nevertheless, the South clinging to slavery saw it differently as we've already seen. Southern states overwhelmingly invoked the Declaration of Independence in their secession documents, believing that the Declaration had declared independence in order to protect the right to own slaves. South Carolina, Mississippi, Tennessee, and other secessionist states did exactly what they believe the Declaration authorized them to do. Quote, whenever any form of government becomes destructive of the ends 
for which it was established, quoting the Declaration of Independence, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new governments. That's what the Confederacy was doing. So deeply committed to slavery was the South that it found that Lincoln was destructive of the ends for which the United States was established. And therefore, it was the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new governments. They founded their confederacy on those principles. But at Gettysburg, to rally the nation against the confederacy, Lincoln described the great task remaining before us of a new birth of freedom. As Roosevelt now explains, Lincoln is fighting a war to break the pre-existing American order because it's the right thing to do, because slavery is an abomination that can no longer be tolerated. And the force that will achieve that new birth of freedom was democracy of the people, by the people, for the people, all the people, not just the insiders. The Confederacy lost the Civil War. Robert E. Lee surrendered at Appomattox on April 9, 1865. Six days later, Lincoln was assassinated. He would not live to see the results of his new birth of freedom that he had inspired. The 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery, was ratified on December 15, 1865. The 14th Amendment overruled the notorious 1857 Dred Scott decision. And this is worth a few moments of our time. Dred Scott was a seven to two majority case written by Chief Justice Roger Tawney who opened the case by asking, quote, can a Negro whose ancestors were imported into this country and sold as slaves become a member of the political community formed and brought into existence by the Constitution of the United States and as such become entitled to all of the rights and privileges and immunities guaranteed by that instrument to the citizens? That's the question. The Supreme Court answered it, no. Tani was clear. We think that black people were not intended to be included under the word citizens in the constitution and can therefore claim none of the rights and privileges which that instrument provides for and secures to citizens of the United States. On the contrary, they were at that time of the American founding considered as a subordinate, an inferior class of being. I'm reading a Supreme Court decision. A subordinate and inferior class of beings who had been subjected by the dominant race and whether emancipated or not, yet remained subject to their authority and had no rights or privileges, but such as those who held the power and the government might choose to grant them. That is what the Supreme Court held. And that is what the 14th Amendment reversed. Today, it's chilling to read these appalling words that were written by a Chief Justice of the Supreme Court speaking for a majority of the court. But that's why the amendment of the Constitution matters so much. The 14th Amendment in its first section says all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. This created federal citizenship for the first time. 
And it went on to say that no state shall make or enforce any law that shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. The second clause repudiated the infamous three-fifths clause and removed that from the Constitution. But until recently, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment was but an obscure historic relic of the Civil War. But the January 6th insurrection changed all that. Section 3 could actually disqualify Donald J. Trump from being president or holding any federal or state office. And only yesterday, a major law review article was published by two members of the Federalist Society concluding that without any other enactments, the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment disqualifies Donald Trump from serving as President of the United States or in any other federal or state office. That's because this current amendment to the Constitution says that no person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of president or vice president, or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States or any state, who, having previously taken an oath as a member of Congress, or as an officer of the United States, or as a member of any state legislature, or as an executive or judicial offer of any state, to support the Constitution of the United States, shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same, or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. But Congress may, by a vote of two-thirds of each House, remove such disability. I won't uh, depart from my purpose today to dwell more on that provision and its current application to Donald Trump, but please think about that. So Roosevelt, having trenchantly examined the history of America, he puts it this way, we are not the founding America. We are not the heirs of the first republic. We are the heirs of the people who destroyed it. We are Reconstruction America. And I said in my review, there's a reason we called it Reconstruction. The book, The Nation That Never Was, sounds an alarm of the dangers that accompany the telling and retelling of the comforting yet false standard story of America. Roosevelt does offer us a better story, one that tells us we should recognize injustices against anyone, even if we ourselves profit from it. It tells that racism may be all around us, but that does not mean we made it, or that the existence of injustices that benefit us does not make us unjust not if we oppose it. The heroes of the better story are the people born into a world they did not make, into a system that is not their fault. They are the heroes because they recognize that, that changing it was their responsibility, and they turned a war from union into a war for freedom, freedom for all, not just for some. And I conclude this particular book review by saying, today Roosevelt believes we are capable of transforming our nation. Quote, if we can meet this moment 
if we can rise to the challenge of making a better America, we can still be the heroes of our own story. <clears throat> the future can be better than the past. And let me conclude my talk today and try to save a few minutes for uh, questions and discussion by highlighting the key findings of this book, sometimes a book's title tells it all, when affirmative action was white. This book is written in the context of affirmative action and its new edition in the context of reparations. Uh, we're committed at ICUJP to present future programs on the reparations movement of the historic thousand page report that the commission, the California Commission on Reparations issued in June of the crying need for us to address reparations in this country. But what the book by Ira Katznelson teaches us is that we already had reparations in this country. It's only that they were for the white middle class in the laws and statutes that were passed uh, in the wake of World War II. Katz Nelson writes his book in light of the 1944 assessment of race relations in the United States written by Gunnar Myrdal in An American Dilemma. Myrdal called the economic situation for African Americans pathological. He concluded that except for a small minority enjoying upper or middle-class status, the masses of American Negroes in the rural South and in the segregated slum quarters in Southern and Northern cities are destitute. They own little property, even their household goods are mostly inadequate and dilapidated. Their incomes are not only low, but irregular. They thus live from day to day and have scant security for the future. That was the state in 1944. And what Katz Nelson does so brilliantly is to show how the federal government perpetuated that poverty through the laws that were passed. So we come to a moment where despite what I've told us this last hour, the South has succeeded. They killed the Reconstruction. They imposed Jim Crow. They imposed segregation and racism. And they continue to use the levels, levers of power. As a result of programs of affirmative action in the post-World War II era, white Americans enjoyed privileged access to state-sponsored economic mobility. So the book devotes separate chapters to each of the statutes that the federal government passed, beginning with the Social Security Act of 1935. Because this wonderful act passed to lift up people after uh, heading into uh, the war, excluded farm workers and domestics. It effectively excluded 65% of African Americans, a number that rose to between 70 and 80% in the South. Given the agrarian nation, nature of the economy, 40% of white farmers were also excluded. So again, that's why racism is systemic in the United States. 
because you have systems, laws, and the enforcement of those laws that perpetuated this form of racism. Although New Deal laws contained anti-discrimination provisions, that was window dressing because the Southern Democrats in Congress guaranteed that the laws would be administered by local officials. The South's heritage of bigotry was both reflected and reinforced in patterns of spending and administration. In 1940, the Social Security Board reported that during the prior two years, the number of Negroes to whom aid was granted was low in proportion to the number who needed assistance, and that's an understatement. <clears throat> Often racist motivations were on full display when debates were held over New Deal reforms. In the debates over the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938, which set minimum wages and minimum hours, Florida Representative John Mark Wilcox argued against paying the same wage for the Negro as is prescribed for the white man, unquote. He warned that, quote, you cannot put the Negro and the white man on the same basis and get away with it. Edward Cox of Georgia was appalled that, quote, organized Negro groups were supporting the new law because it will, quote, render easier the elimination and disappearance of racial and social distinctions. Katz Nelson spends a revealing chapter on the impacts of racial segregation in the military during World War II. Throughout the war, the official Army War College training manual taught, and I'm quoting from our government manual used throughout World War II, quote, the Negro is docile, tractable, lighthearted, carefree and good natured, careless, shiftless, irresponsible and secretive, and unmoral, untruthful, and his sense of right doing is relatively inferior." Unquote. Almost no black people served on local draft boards. What we are doing, said the director of the Selective Service, Lieutenant Colonel Lewis Hershey in 1944, is simply transferring discrimination from everyday life into the army. So now, if I've talked about political science and teaching and textbooks, now the military becomes the uh, next breeding ground and uh, teaching forum to teach and impose racism and discrimination. By the world war's end, 11% of white men in the military were officers compared to less than 1% of black men in uniform. War service, Katz Nelson writes, ended with a wider gap between white and blacks as white access to training and occupational advancement moved ahead at a much more vigorous pace. This kind of racial animus was carried over into the administration of the GI Bill, arguably the most wide ranging set of social benefits ever offered by the government. The, and I will summarize here to save time, using local draft boards and, and local, I'm sorry, local boards and local banks the Veterans Administration local officers discriminated against Blacks. Virtually no Black veterans were given access to skilled employment. By October 1946, of the 6,500 former soldiers placed into non-farm jobs, 86% 
where skilled of the skilled and semi-skilled positions were filled by whites, 92% of the unskilled positions by black people. Loans in, in the North and South were imposed through discrimination. In New York and New Jersey suburbs, only 100 of 67,000 mortgages issued by the GI Bill supported home purchases for non-white people. This was the biggest boondoggle to support white affirmative action, and it didn't have to be that way. I've put in the announcement today links to my book reviews, and I'm skipping ahead here to save a little bit of time for questions because you can go to these book reviews. The statistics that uh, Katz Nelson has accumulated are shocking. But I do want to end by reminding us that we are about to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington on August 28, uh, 1963. And in the very first sentence of Dr. Martin Luther King's historic I Have a Dream speech, he invoked the Emancipation Proclamation. He called it a momentous decree, a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. But he also bemoaned the fact that 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, the Negro is still languishing in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. And so we have come today to dramatize that shameful condition. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. He called it a promissory note. And I will say to you another 60 years after Martin Luther King spoke those words, they still ring true. It is time, I believe, and I know everyone on this screen and listening to my voice believes, it's time for us to pay that debt in full. Thank you very much for listening to a lot of words and a lot of thoughts today. I appreciate it so much. And we have two hands up, so I'll go to them immediately. Carol Francis. Um, it reminded me, I went into a library in the 1980s, found this children's book on um, Native Americans, and it said, I was just blown away by this. The golden age of American Indians was after the uh, Europeans came because they brought the gun and the horse. And I don't believe in messing up books, but I did take that into a stall in the restroom and annotated it. And I don't know who finally found it on the shelf and read it, but um, I, I'm wondering if the author of the book about, I think it was the second one, you read the 2014 book by Ger Dr. Gerald Horn, The Counter-Revolution of, of 1776 because it seems like that was what it was based on. And his whole premise is how, um, is how 1776 was the counter revolution for that reason. Uh, Jackie Goldberg brought me into understanding about the, uh, yes, there it is, about um, the, the the, the um, re reconstruction era um and i'm wondering if african americans can sue the state of of florida for saying you know the books that they accept and that they're pushing into the curriculum give them that sense that this whole movement of florida says we want our poor white kids to not have these feelings. 
So I'm wondering if African Americans are considering or now working on suing the state of Florida for those reasons. Yes, those very lawsuits are pending. They've had some preliminary success. There are federal judges in Florida who actually do follow the Constitution. Um, and I think, and we did this in our educational series of Friday Forum some months ago, and I think we could revisit the whole and update the whole question because people, uh, people of color, people of conscience are not taking this lying down. The ACLU, the Penn Center, the American Library Association are all fighting back uh, against these laws. Rick. This, this was very informative. I really wanted to thank you for, um, you know, the, I'm sure you have like a, a separate book you have in front of you full of just footnotes and annotations. So uh, I, I really appreciate that. Oh, what struck me when you were speaking too is that because of the way that um, the American um, capitalist system is set up, that these ideas about you know marginalization have crept into um, American history as far as things like the the found the financial a aspects of of any sort of equality. Um, what struck me is that you could you know the Milton Friedman was somebody who was very much influenced by uh, writers. Um, of the the early part of the century and his writings about capitalism and and a free market um really were the were the basis for the american conservative movement at the time and that idea of financial freedom did not include people of color you know um so um, in a way the the uh, the idea that that the um, Teutonic um, people, as you, know, you put it, or uh, that their ideas that they were superior to to other races and stuff um, had to be, in a way, legislated and had to be legally um, uh, implemented by marginalizing other people. So, um, yeah, I think I think that's an important concept to think about. It is. And what you're sparking in me and I uh, it's kind of outside my content area, mm -hmm. but we could look at banking. We yeah. could look at real estate. We can look at uh, corporations. These institutions have have perpetuated uh, racism. Uh, and they are built on hierarchies of power that have always uh, diminished uh, people of color. And I must say, uh, I or someone could give an entire uh, talk uh, applying this uh, to the rights of women mm -hmm. and the rights of Native Americans. Uh, and nothing I've said today is is meant to diminish any of that. We often... We have to speak about what we're focusing on at the time. And, and these books uh, were looking at the question of slavery and, and uh, racism in America. But much the same kind of marginalization uh, has been uh, directed at, at every group that was not a white male uh, in the United States. And I would love to see studies that do what you've suggested here uh, to look at other institutions uh, in America. Uh, Anthony Manousis, uh, who's not with us today, has been so helpful uh, in looking at uh, real estate and land owning and the denial of, uh, of the creation of wealth. Um, I want to uh, pause, yes, Daryl. I didn't want to interrupt you. I, That's fine. Oh, certainly your overview of U.S. history is quite different than my major in history at a L.A. college 
called Pepperdine back in the 50s um, that are largely uh, Southern um, uh, professors. But I wanted to ask you, uh, you mentioned the uh, early 1700s slavery, uh, slave uh, arriving in England and being uh, accepted there. And yet this was about the time, wasn't it, that England was making effective slaves of colonies and how, how do we uh, uh, how do we see what they were doing in India and, and parts of Africa square with that and then one last question is uh, to what degree to, to what extent would the 1619 project that came out two years ago that was so ballyhooed and uh, also fit into this thank you yeah. uh, I've got my copy of it right there too and I won't waste time uh, yes, and you know when I when I write and study and do these talks, every time uh, you mention something, you can think of the countervailing uh, interests and and history. So nothing in this talk uh, was meant to lift up uh, uh, England uh, and the uh, and Great Britain uh, as a model of uh, human rights. Uh, you're absolutely right. There was a there was a uh, two sidedness, uh, you know, a duplicity uh, in its treatment domestically and then its treatment in colonialism around the world, uh, and that deserves a lot of examination and a lot of condemnation and and uh, the perpetuation of all of these racial stereotypes in uh, India and uh, uh, the other colonies. Uh, so that's that's very true. And uh, I probably in the formal remarks should have mentioned 1619. It's a groundbreaking book. Now it's in book form. Uh, it was an early effort to say that a moving force in all this was uh, those victims of uh, slavery, that there was agency on their part to rebel against their slave owners and to uh, form a, a crucial part of overturning slavery. They were hardly passive uh, in that effort. I want to say that in the chat, there is there is our links to my book reviews, and we're coming close to our time. Daryl, okay. uh, well, I just add one other thing, uh, by the way, uh, regarding the early British thing uh, and slavery, there was a movie made that featured Benedict Cumberbatch, the great actor, uh, that was shown here in America about this process in which the parliament there had to overcome this, their uh, uh, enslavement to enslavement. <laughs> yeah, was that Wilberforce? Was uh, he the uh, well, yeah, I think it was, but... Benedict Cumberbatch played that role very well. Let me yeah. get let me get Phil and I'll go to Carol Francis as we finish. You're on mute. Okay. Anyway, um, on the subject of England, um, in the uh, late '50s, early '60s, I was involved with uh, the Black community in uh, Oakland, and. Um, I had a, a roommate who had some Quaker roots, a black guy who was, had some Quaker roots, who we roomed together and became very good friends for many years. And we got involved in the civil rights movement together mm -hmm. uh, around 1960. And the thing, he several years after that, he married a British woman and moved to England. Um, with the full belief that he would be escaping American racist institutions. Didn't work. <laughs> uh, no. And within, within a few years, he was working as a community organizer around race issues in London. <laughs> um, and, and I believe he still is. Um, okay. But and anyway, my and, and the other point, just to, to amplify what uh, Daryl said, uh, England, through col massive world colonialism, probably one of the biggest perpetrators of racism in the world. Good, glad we've said that. Carol Francis, quickly. 
and then we'll go to Ruby. Um, yeah, Barry the Chains answers uh, Daryl's brilliant question. It's my first introduction to the global struggle against slavery. And one of the reasons England wanted to end the slave trade was to defeat France, which was making its wealth off of the off of Haiti. Great. Uh, Ruby, did you have a comment on this? And then we should close. Yes, and um, I was very lucky because I was raised in a high consciousness in Colorado of all colors and all nationalities. Uh, this is born in my family, uh, miscegenation. And, you know, I look at this and what they're giving power to, and th there is a consciousness here of, of segregation and of, of power. So where do we go from here? You know, it, it, there's, there is going to be um, a separation, but there could be positive changes with this separation, with segregation, with integration. And the positive changes is the positive choices of how we teach the young releasing the fear, releasing the anger, because what they're doing is, and, and I was thinking about giving power to the people. I know you heard that, is that is important for what we go forward into right now, because yeah. the slavery is in the mind and, the slave, and, and that's where the slavery is, because there's so many people here now you see that they're going forward and what they're teaching and how things are growing, the multicultural, positive changes, choices, actions, reactions to what the situation is. So this is what we have to give power to. Now, we know all these things happen and everything. These still are undercover. You know, they're quiet, they're, they're hidden, and they're still happening because they're still teaching the fear that of different races. So what, what is important now is the changes that we can do in the multicultural, the positive changes in action. I, when you look at this thing that's happening, you look at it on TV and everything else, <clears throat> this is choices that they're mm -hmm. teaching the children that they can do and they can give instead of teaching the choices of the integration. And the integration is still, it's, it's separation is okay, but still integrating yes. the positive things that we can do to make this a better world. And this is what we have to give power to. The international reconstruction of the now, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> is what we've got to work through. And this is in every area, every language, because <laughs> now, there is hate and there is there is discrimination in all colors. It's not just the white folks, uh, but in all colors. But teaching the integration and the patience and the love and the power that we can work together on to keep this into a better world. So this is what we've got to do: is give the right. now. You're so right, Ruben. Uh, I, I want a few moments of your time to lift up uh, my daughter and two grandchildren up here in Sonoma, all of whom have contracted COVID. Uh, and by extension, uh, some other people we know. Uh, it, is, it is out there. Uh, it's difficult in these times to know what precautions to take, especially inside with masks. Certainly uh, be fully vaccinated. I believe a new booster may be coming later in the fall, um, but uh, they are uh, modestly okay and uh, will certainly come through this. Uh, but Is I that know your I, daughter or granddaughter? I'm sorry. Uh, my daughter and yes. two uh, grandsons. Okay. Uh, got it. Uh, special fine. thanks to Phil for uh, his wonderful uh, reflection. Thanks to our speaker today. Thanks to everyone else uh, who joined us uh, throughout this program.